My name is Jeff Shara. We are sitting on Little Round Top at Gettysburg. A little over 150 years ago, something extraordinary happened here. Lives were changed, history was changed. But the lessons you get in a history book really don't mean anything unless you can walk this ground and see what happened here through the eyes of the people who actually were here. That's the purpose of historical fiction, to tell you the story, historically accurate, but to put you there, to put you in the heads of the people who did the deed, who preserved this land for us today so that we can learn that history, that we can understand what was fought for here, who died, why, how, what it felt like, what it smelled like. That's the purpose of historical fiction. I love coming to pieces of ground like this, not for the not for the textbook lesson, not for the facts and figures, but to get the feel of what it was like to walk this ground in 1863, when right down, right over this hill, the enemy's coming at you intent on killing you. That's the kind of feeling you can only get from a novel, and I'm proud to be involved in that. The death of Stonewall Jackson is well chronicled. There were a lot of witnesses there, a lot of people wrote about it. We know that he died at 3.15 in the afternoon on May 10th, 1863. Um, it was a Sunday. What was going on in that room in the minds of the people? That's my job as the storyteller, to take you with me. What were Jackson's last moments like? Well, of course, the historian can't tell you that. There's no way for us to ever know that. That's the storyteller's job. That's what historical fiction can do, is it can tell you that story. In Gods and Generals, that was the climactic scene in that book for me. Uh, one of the hardest things I've ever done. I was weeping as I wrote it, um, as I had to kill a character I had learned to love. But that's what historical fiction can do. It can make you love the characters. In my own research, I rely on the diaries, the memoirs, the collections of letters, the accounts of the people who were there, or who were here, uh, to get that story. It's one thing to read a history book or a biography, uh, it's quite another to hear the words uh, and to hear as the people recall it themselves, what they went through. That's the source material. It's not just making up stories. Um, fiction can be anything. I had a historian tell me once, you can write anything you want to. You can make up all the stories you want. They don't have to be true. I don't really agree with that. When you're dealing with the Civil War, when you're dealing with characters like Joshua Lawrence Chamberlain on Little Round Top, you'd better get it right. But beyond that, the only way you can tell his story is to get inside his head. That's the great fun for me, whether it's Lee or Grant or Chamberlain or John Reynolds or Pickett and on and on and on. Um, that's what's fun for me, and I think the readers enjoy that as well. It's not just the history lesson, it's the story of who these people were telling their story the way they would tell it. The best illustration I can give you of how historical fiction can bring new people, new eyes, new audience, audiences into this subject matter is classrooms children, school kids, high school kids, who come to me and they say, they, with that look of pain when they think I'm gonna give them a lecture about history, and then they realize, no, it's not about history, it's about storytelling. That telling them about a character that they can relate to, that they can get involved with, suddenly it comes alive for them. I've seen this time and time again, whether it's at Gettysburg or, or around schools around the country, to have students come up to you and say, wow, I didn't know that, I wanna know more. To me, that's the greatest gift a storyteller can give an audience, is to make that audience want to know more. George Patton famously said that an army is a team, and that is a very true statement, but there's one part of the army team that a lot of people overlook when they consider Civil War armies when they study Civil War armies. That is specifically the command staff of each of the generals in the Army. Now, when we think of Army headquarters, most people think of the building that houses the commanding general. But in reality, an Army headquarters, or even a Corps headquarters, or a division headquarters, or even a brigade headquarters, is actually a fairly large group of people. In the case of an Army, it can be up to about 100 people, including staff officers, clerks, teamsters, drivers, and even a headquarters guard from time to time. It gets smaller 
the lower down you go, Corps commanders have a smaller headquarters, division commanders have an even smaller headquarters, brigade commanders have a very small headquarters, and even regiments have a headquarters. It's usually the colonel, the top two or three officers, and the regimental adjutants. But when you think of the headquarters, that is often what you must think about. It's not just a specific location. It's a living, breathing entity of people. Staff officers occupy a very, very important function in how an army lives, moves, and fights. A lot of times they do the grunt work that translates a commander's directives into action. They also are liaisons between the commander and subordinate commanders and oftentimes are assigned as guides or are often assigned to help coordinate attacks, movements, layout defenses, any number of tasks. So staff is an extremely, extremely important part of this team, of how this team works. Now, what goes into a command staff? What does a general have on a staff? There are several different jobs that staff officers have. The first, quite frankly, is to be a personal aide to the general. Brigade commanders are authorized one aide, and it increases in number all the way up to four for an army commander to perform various tasks as assigned by the commanding general, if nothing else, be the commanding general's alter ego. That's the role of an aide, very, very important role. And then you have a variety of officers that are assigned a variety of jobs. You have deputies for quartermaster, commissary, subsistence, signal, topographical engineers who make maps, who scout different roads, things of that nature. You have provost marshal who take care of any disciplinary cases. You have judge advocate general who are the army lawyers. And you have the adjutant general who I mentioned earlier in one case, who basically does the paperwork and uh, keeps the administrative machinery running. The general wants to know on any given day how many men are available for active duty, he's going to ask the adjutant. So the staff officer is a very, very important brain and a very, very important support network for any commanding general. Because there's no intelligence and operations staff either, this also means that when generals go down, when they take casualties, either being killed or wounded, it can often have a profound impact on a course of a battle. To cite just two prominent examples, on July 2nd, 1863, as he spearheaded the entire attack of the Confederate Army at Gettysburg, John Bell Hood led his division of 8,000 men, four brigades forward, and almost immediately went down with a very serious wound. His division fell into disarray. They pressed the attack and pressed it well, but it became disorganized, uncoordinated, and it was not as good as it could have been. Another example, September 17, 1862, during the Battle of Antietam, when Israel Richardson's division breaks the line in the center at the Bloody Lane, a Confederate officer said the end of the Confederacy was within sight. And as Richardson was beginning to organize a pursuit, beginning to organize a breakthrough, he went down with a very serious mortal wound. Disorganized the Federals. Nobody had the knowledge to really pick up where he left off. And so the momentum was lost, and with it, the opportunity was lost. When we think about the Civil War, and when we think about the tactics, when we think about how these armies move and fight on the battlefield, we must remember these factors. Organization alone does not ensure success. But disorganization, either through poor staff work, poor coordination, or just a, a bad leader loss at a bad time can often prevent victory or can affect the course of the battle. Winfield Scott was one of the five greatest soldiers in United States history. I think there's no question about that. Unfortunately, he, he isn't often remembered that way now. He was a towering figure in the 19th century. His career extends from the War of 1812, when he was one of the soldiers pushing for a more professional United States Army, uh, through the War with Mexico, where his campaign from Veracruz to Mexico City was one of the great military operations in all of military history. The Duke of Wellington said Scott was the greatest soldier of the age because of what he did in Mexico, down to the early part of the Civil War when he was General-in-Chief of United States Armies. He was Lieutenant General by brevet, uh, the rank that George Washington had had and only George Washington had had as a regular rank. Winfield Scott in the early stage of the Civil War took a clear-eyed look at what kind of conflict it might be. He knew it would take longer, he knew it would take far more men, and he had a great sense of knowing that just because you put a uniform on someone doesn't make them a soldier. Someone with a uniform on is someone with a uniform on, unless they've been trained and turned into a soldier. And so he argued for taking your time to prepare. He put forward what came to be called the Anaconda Plan.
which is essentially how the United States waged the Civil War in broad outline. Blockade the Confederate coasts, deny them material that they would be bringing in from abroad, uh, take control of the Mississippi River to divide the Confederacy into two pieces, and if necessary, if those two things were not enough, project United States military power deep into the hinterlands of the Confederacy. That's essentially the strategy the United States had used during the war with Mexico, blockading the Gulf Coast of Mexico, severing the northern provinces from the rest of Mexico, and then striking toward uh, the capital of the Mexican Republic in the end. He had a good sense of how these kinds of wars would play out. He had that sense from the War of 1812 as well. When the British Navy had complete control over the American coastline, he understood how important that was. He understood how if you controlled that, you could project your military power wherever you wanted to, whether into the Chesapeake or toward New Orleans later in the war, within a War of 1812 context, or against New Orleans within a Civil War context, or anywhere along the Atlantic coast. Winfield Scott was a major American thinker of the mid-19th century, one of the most influential soldiers in all of our history, and a figure who literally ties the early 19th century military history of the United States to the mid-19th century history, uh, military history of the United States with the Civil War, a colossal figure. Scott was very old when the war broke out. He was in his mid-70s, and he was physically a wreck. He'd led a good life and had eaten and drunk a great deal, and he was sort of a mass of uh, decaying flesh by 1861, although his mind was still very sharp. Uh, Lincoln listened to him and took his advice, but he had a pushy younger officer who came on the scene, George B. McClellan, who didn't really respect Scott and was very much on the way up. And in the end, I think Scott had had his belly full of any kind of bickering and decided to retire and go to West Point and write his memoirs. He left as general in chief in the autumn of 1861. Uh, George B. McClellan replaced him. Scott uh, certainly wasn't up to field command by the time the Civil War came, but he had played a very useful part early on, and he sort of edged out, partly edged out, and partly just understood that it was time to go uh, for a person in his mid-70s, and he had time to write his memoirs. He wrote his two-volume memoirs uh, while he was at West Point in the third person, which is very interesting. Then General Scott, then Colonel Scott did this. Uh, they're sort of fun. You can see his ego coming through them, uh, but he had a reason to have an ego. He was a man of considerable accomplishment. It's very unfortunate that most Americans don't have any sense of what union meant in a mid-19th century context. The concept of union. Union was the most important word in the political vocabulary of mid-19th century Americans. And if we don't understand what the concept of union meant, we have absolutely no chance of understanding the Civil War era. Not a slight chance, no chance. You have to come to terms with union or you cannot understand why someone from Vermont or someone from Wisconsin would put on a blue uniform and risk his life to make South Carolina come back into the Union. Why wouldn't they just say, let South Carolina go? Who cares about South Carolina? I never liked it anyway. I'm not going to risk my life to make South Carolina come back. What they were willing to risk their lives for was maintenance of the Union. And the Union had a very specific meaning to them. It meant having a voice in your own government, a government that was of the people. Uh, as uh, Abraham Lincoln reminded his fellow citizens of the loyal states, you had a direct voice in your government when that was true almost nowhere else in the world in the mid-19th century, including in Great Britain. It also meant, Union did, that you had a chance to rise economically. You weren't doomed to be what your father was. Abraham Lincoln was a poster boy for this notion of Union. He was born poor, he became a prosperous lawyer, he became President of the United States. People who loved the Union would have said that can happen nowhere else. The flood of immigrants into the United States, in their view, proved that there was no place else in the world like the United States. However desperate a situation might be for an immigrant in the United States, there was the chance to do better. And it offended people who loved the Union that slaveholding states had decided to destroy the handiwork of the founding generation just because they didn't like who was elected president. If you can destroy the nation just because you don't agree with the result of an election, the union doesn't deserve 
to go on longer. And if it didn't go on longer, however, democracy, small d democracy in the world might be dead. It didn't exist anywhere else. There was a great deal at stake. When Abraham Lincoln spoke about the last best hope of Earth, this is what he meant, this conception of union. And from 1861, to 1865, if we had been able to poll citizens in the loyal states and ask them, what is this war about? They would have told us Union. People who loved the Union uh, in the loyal states believed that slaveholders did not believe in democracy. They saw them as oligarchs. They called them oligarchs all the time. And they said they were on the side of the oligarchs and aristocrats and monarchists in Europe. Uh, people in the loyal states who loved Union also knew that small d democracy was in retreat in Europe. Uh, the revolutions of the late 1840s had been failures in Europe. They really believed that the only place where democracy had a real chance to succeed was in the United States and they believed secession would destroy that promise of democracy. It had been a, a legal election. Nobody claimed that Abraham Lincoln stole the election. The slaveholders, from the perspective of unionists, just didn't like who won, and so they were going to destroy the republic because they didn't like who won. That was something that simply was not acceptable to people who believed in union, who believed in the work of the founding generation. They said every drop of blood shed during the revolution will be shed in vain if we don't stop this effort to dismantle the union. The election of 1864 is one of the great pivotal moments of the Civil War, and I think it's one that's underappreciated in some ways. There have been few presidential elections in American history that have offered as stark a choice. You have the sitting president, Abraham Lincoln, uh, who is presiding over a troubled Republican Party, a divided Republican Party in many ways on the one side, and you have George Brinton McClellan on the other, uh, one of the great Union War heroes early in the conflict who fell out with the Lincoln administration. If the Democrats won in 1864, there was a good chance that negotiations for peace might have begun immediately. And there was an absolutely certain chance that emancipation would be taken off the table for the United States. In contrast, if the Republicans won, voters knew that the war would be pressed forward to victory as energetically as possible, and emancipation would remain a sine qua non of the United States victory. It's a stark, stark choice. And it's a choice in a campaign that illustrates, as well as anything else during the war, the profound ties between the non-military sphere and the military sphere. What was going to happen when people went into the voters' booths or voted outside or however they voted if they were soldiers, those people voting were going to make a determination that would have political ramifications based almost entirely on what was going on on the battlefields. United States morale had dropped to its low point for the entire war. By July and August of 1864, Abraham Lincoln had famously predicted uh, with his blind memorandum to the cabinet on August 23rd that the Republicans were not going to be re-elected. Uh, members of his own party had tried to dump him from the ticket. The Republicans didn't even call themselves Republicans in 1864. They ran as the Union Party, trying to attract Democratic support. They threw Hannibal Hamlin off the ticket and added Andrew Johnson, a Democrat. Uh, from one of the rebel states who had remained loyal to the Union. All these are efforts to attract as wide a voter base as possible in the midst of a war that seemed to be going the wrong way from the Republican perspective. The hideous losses of the Overland campaign, the, what had turned into a grinding siege at Petersburg, William Tecumseh Sherman's inability to capture Atlanta through July and August, all of these things had brought Union morale to a low point. And the fact that a little rebel army under Jubal Early had reached the outskirts of Washington in July and shelled the city and brought the President of the United States under fire seemed to indicate the war was a failure to many people in the United States. But Sherman's victory at Atlanta during the first week in September and then Philip Sheridan's three great victories in the Shenandoah Valley between September 19th and October 19th sent the message to voters in the United States that the war had turned around. It brought a wave of much greater optimism to voters in the United States. And in the end, as we know, Abraham Lincoln was reelected. The Republicans won huge majorities in both the House and the Senate. And from that point on, that second week in November on, 
any chance for Confederate victory was at best remote. So it's an election that had tremendous consequences. It's an election whose results were tied directly to what men in blue and gray uniforms were doing on battlefields. And it is one of the great dramatic and important moments of the Civil War. The Civil War era saw a number of technological advances in many fields, but by far the most important to the Civil War soldier were the advances made in weaponry, specifically in small arms. A small arm is any handheld weapon that can be carried by a single soldier and used in combat. This includes handheld weapons such as pistols and revolvers, or shoulder weapons like muskets, rifled muskets, and carbines. Prior to the Civil War, nearly every army in the world used muzzle-loading smooth bore muskets. These are weapons that load here at the muzzle or business end of the weapon. You pour down a charge of powder followed by a spherical smooth bore round which you would then ram down before firing down range. The Civil War, however, saw the advent of breech loading weapons. These weapons load here at the breech which allows a soldier to load and fire more quickly. This is especially desirable to cavalry who want to load and fire while on horseback. Building off of this concept were the repeating rifles, which not only loaded here at the breech, but also loaded multiple rounds at one time in a single tube or magazine. The Spencer rifle, as an example, had seven rounds in its magazine, which allowed those troops to fire, according to their opponents, to load on Sunday and fire all week. But these are by far exceptions to the rule. The most common Civil War weapon for a Civil War soldier was one like this, this 1861 rifled musket or its British counterpart, the 1853 Enfield. These rifled muskets load at the muzzle, but the barrel features grooves or rifling. At the beginning of the Civil War, troops armed with smoothbore weapons would be hard pressed to hit their targets in the tree line behind me. But armed with a rifled musket, troops could hit targets two and three times that distance. And if they were expert, perhaps even five and six times farther. This gives us an idea of just how accurate and just how deadly Civil War weapons became. I'm joined today by Matt George, who is not only a reenactor, but the Civil War Trust Land Stewardship Manager. We're going to go through and show you the process by which these Civil War weapons were loaded. This is a nine step process referred to as load in nine times. We're going to go through it and show you how these weapons were loaded. Load in nine times, load. At this, Matt will bring this piece in front of him. He's now reached back to his cartridge box where he will then handle cartridge. He takes a paper cartridge out of his pack. Tear cartridge. He now rips the paper to expose the black powder within the paper cartridge. He will then charge cartridge. At this, he pours the black powder down the barrel and removes the rest of the paper that surrounds the conical bullet. The projectile he is loading is one of these, a mini ball named after Claude Etienne Minet, who created this bullet. Unlike projectiles of an earlier age, this is not a round bullet, but rather a conical bullet, which is shaped more like a bullet that we would see today. This is perhaps the deadliest small arms projectile of its era. Now that he's got that bullet in the barrel, Matt will then draw rammer. He will then ram cartridge. He rams that bullet down to the bottom to the breech of the gun and seats the powder. He will then return rammer. The next step is probably one of the most important, prime. With this, he brings up his piece, brings the weapon to half cock, and places a percussion cap onto the nipple of the gun. This percussion cap, when struck by the hammer, will create a spark which will ignite the powder and shoot the bullet downrange. This weapon is now ready to shoot. Shoulder, arms. Once every man in his company and every man in his battalion is come to this position, the commanding officer knows that his troops are loaded and ready to shoot. And so is Matt, so he's gonna take a turn and take a shot at this target. Ready. He now brings the weapon to full cock. Aim. Fire. Weapons like these rifled muskets were responsible for most battlefield casualties of the Civil War. And these technological advances, as well as others, made the Civil War the deadliest war of its time and changed the face of warfare forever.
my name is Robert Lee Hodge, and I've been reenacting for 33 years. Reenacting is probably, for me, uh, an argument for visual history that uh, you can learn things visually from reenacting. You can learn about drill, you can learn about uniforms, you can learn about what it looked like or what we think it looked like. One of the most important things in reenacting to me, maybe the most important, is what reenactors call their impression, which is what they look like, their physical appearance. If you're a reenactor or somebody that's into uh, historical interpretation uh, in these uniforms, then often you like to gravitate to more of a purist type of event, perhaps, where there's more stringent authenticity guidelines. So reenactors try to mimic some of the most basic movements in the manual. Now some more astute reenactment units that are more into the manual and more into drill will get into the more complicated movements. But remember, we do this stuff on occasion uh, throughout the year. We're not doing this every day. So our proficiency in drill is much, much, much lower than, of course, what real Civil War soldiers would be doing. One of, the, one of the things that I am always interested in is the sound of a battle. And what did that audio sound like? The soldiers write about the orchestra of battle, where the ball had opened, and they talk about the sounds of the projectiles like musical notes in a horrific, horrific opera. So I wanted to get a better sense of what those things sounded like. And so going to the North-South Skirmish Association shoots, there'll be hundreds of people firing muskets at targets. And so that sound, you cannot get anywhere else. And so that's a wonderful resource to go to. One thing I do want to say about reenacting, I've been reenacting 33 years. And in my 32nd year of reenacting, I was at a uh, Antietam reenactment. It was called Maryland by Maryland. And they did a reenactment of the cornfield uh, the uh, famous cornfield fighting at Antietam, Sharpsburg. And it was the most authentic thing I had ever been in. We didn't do much shooting at all, but it was apocalyptic looking. The, the ground fog from the nearby Potomac River had turned the area into some sort of mist, misty, surreal looking place. And then all this gunfire erupts and you can't really see a whole lot. And the sun's rising and it's a big orange ball and you're going through this cornfield not knowing what's going on and there's all the sound of gunfire and chaos and it was very believable. It's important to me to create that visual illusion. Um, I go back to the idea of visual history and it's harder to quantify why visual history, if you want to use that term, matters, but I believe it does. It stimulates me. It stimulated me as a child. How many kids today can be visually stimulated by this stuff as to what it looked like? And so that's one of the reasons why I strive so hard to create the visual, uh, what I think is the visual believability of uh, Union uh, and Confederate soldiers. Overall, I'd have to say this about reenactors is that it's, it's been one of the most rewarding things of my life. It's been a lifelong journey and a lifelong quest. And I'd have to say as far as the subculture of people that I've been around, and I've been around reenactors a lot, I'd have to say that they're some of the best people that I've ever run into. Uh, extremely knowledgeable, good-hearted people for the most part, and lots of humor. And all those elements are stimulating reason for me to continue to go to reenactments. It's never long before a National Park Service ranger or a battlefield guide gets the dreaded question, why are all battles fought in national parks? Well, of course they're not. They're fought in places like this, in open fields, on farms, in people's backyards, around cities, and they were usually fought to accomplish a particular objective. You are trying to capture an enemy's army. You are trying to capture a critical or strategic position. You are trying to gain supplies. You are trying to cut off an enemy army if possible. There are a bunch of reasons why these things are fought, but they would end up in these 
these engagements. They could be small, they could be large. The Civil War is fought in 10,000 different places, of which about 400 of them are seen by Congress as key engagements. And it is these 400 battlefields or so that the Civil War Trust and other preservation groups really work to preserve today. In the decades following the Civil War, veterans came back to the battlefields on which they fought. This was hallowed ground. This is where they had done their great deeds, uh, where they exhibited every human emotion, uh, bravery, cowardice, um, fear, exhilaration. They would come back to these places and often they were coming back to farmers fields. Sometimes they were coming back to people's backyards. But increasingly as the decades went on, they were actually going back to battlefield parks starting in 1863 and then much more in the 1880s and 1890s. Land was actually being preserved where soldiers could come and uh, reflect and commemorate and actually erect monuments and hold reunions. This really reached its golden age in the 1890s when the federal government created national military parks, places like Vicksburg and Chickamauga and Gettysburg and Shiloh and Antietam, to later to be added uh, by places like Harpers Ferry and here where we stand at Spotsylvania. The veterans came back and really made these battlefields. They put in monuments. They um, uh, drove stakes into the ground as to where important deeds had taken place. To be sure, more battlefields were preserved into the middle of the 20th century. However, with Civil War veterans dying off, with World War being fought, uh, with a war in Korea, um, things had really died off in terms of preservation, but the Civil War centennial really placed a lot of emphasis upon the Civil War. People were remembering and commemorating the Civil War and really trying to re-figure out what had happened. As the Civil War centennial ended and the Vietnam War heated up and people had really just, again, had enough of war, they had enough about thinking about war, seeing movies about war, and battlefield preservation really died off at that point. And so did Civil War scholarship to a, to a degree. You were going to have a rebirth of interest in the Civil War and its preservation, really in the 1980s, where Civil War roundtables are growing, publications about the Civil War are thriving, the movie Glory comes out, eventually the Ken Burns series comes out, and 40 million people watch that particular series, and the modern battlefield preservation movement is born. There are a bunch of local groups and that is also when the Civil War Trust's predecessor organizations are born and you are going to have battlefield preservation thrive on a scale that it hadn't since the 1890s. The federal government has saved in total around 75,000 acres of battlefield land and they've done that over the last century or so. The Civil War Trust has saved about 40,000 acres in the last 15 years. Once these battlefields were preserved as places, veterans and their families came to visit, and eventually their descendants would come to visit these places. And this is important. It's important to not forget your history, um, and it's really hard to understand what happened at a place without the battlefield, the primary source, the most primary source of all. When combined with photographs and accounts and early maps, you can really only understand a battle when you can stand there and look at what happened where. When you go to a battlefield, there are earthworks not only where the soldiers fought, but they were built by the soldiers. They're exactly where they placed them. And those earthworks, those lunettes, the views described from certain heights over toward other ridges, those are the things the soldiers wrote about. Those are the things you can stand there and read their words and understand what they were talking about. A battlefield provides an experience that nothing else can. There's no set way for people to engage with battlefields. I, as a battlefield guide, have seen every range of emotion as I've been leading battlefield tours. People get sad. People People get happy at things like victory. They, they uh, brim with pride. They lash out. They pass out. Uh, people uh, on battlefields, some don't have a great interest in the Civil War, but they, they look at trees and they bird watch and do all sorts of things. And the veterans knew this. They created battlefields as rural parks in some cases, and battlefields of today are created more as interpretive experiences. But that is up to the visitor. People come to these places. They come to understand American history, the Civil War, and uh, that particular battlefield a little bit better.